Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and a great honor to present the lecture which was written by my dear friend and teacher Walter Schwery, a death psychologist in Bremgarten near Bern, Switzerland, uh, on the Red Book which Carl Gustav Jung has written. And the title is The Meaning of the Mandala in the Red Book and the Speechlessness of Carl Gustav Jung. This paper was presented in German uh, a couple of months ago in Rütte, the center where Karl Friedrich Dürkheim was living in German. And this English translation was done by my son Patrick and was improved a lot by my Canadian friend and editor for my English books, Richard Warrington in Souk on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. The year of 1913 has been a special year indeed. Not only the first volume of Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time has been published with Edmund Husslers general introduction to pure phenomenology and phenomenological philosophy, another book of revolutionary impact was created. It has induced a vast paradigm shift in philosophy. Positivistic realities of the environment were abandoned in favor of the matter of consciousness. In 1913, Jung also began writing down his dreams and inner experiences in the book which was covered in red leather. His journey of self-analysis started. It can be asked, well, what the triggers for starting the red book have been. Certainly one of the most important motivations was the split up between Jung and Freud which was interpreted as if Jung committed patricide. But Jung did not only discard Freud's libido theory as a central doctrine. Moreover, Jung accused himself of Lea's majesty in a letter. This Lea's majesty has not only affected Freud heavily, it also completely threw Jung off the track. As Freud and Jung both suppressed the anger successfully, they were plunged into severe depression. Jung's reaction can also be explained by the consequent absence of a father figure. This crisis has prevented him from continuing his teaching activities at the University of Zurich. Now, the time had come for Jung as a prospective therapist to finally face the power and psychic hazards himself. Firstly, he noted down the fantasies that arose from those experiences in the Black Book. And later on, he transferred his discoveries into the Red Book, which he also decorated with illustrations. It contains the majority of his mandala drawings. Jung described this process as an insufficient attempt to aesthetically elaborate his fantasies. Thus, it has never been completed. And in his biography he says, quote, It became clear to me that I was not speaking the right language and that I had to translate still, it still. So I soon gave up an aestheticizing in order to make an effort of serious understanding. I came to the conclusion that such a great amount of fantasy also requires a solid foundation which can only be achieved by returning to the human reality. To me, this reality has been scientific understanding. Concrete conclusions had to be drawn from the insight that my unconscious has displayed me. This has become the objective of my life work. 
unquote. And he continued, the aestheticizing elaboration in the Red Book has been crucial, even though it upsets to me so greatly in the beginning. It brought up the insights about the ethical commitment towards the images. There will never be any language, no matter how complete it would be, that could substitute life. However, if a language attempts to substitute life, not only will the language itself be corrupted, but the very essence of life. And in order to break free from the tyranny of unconscious prerequisites, both are necessary. Redemption of intellectual as well as ethical commitment. Of course, it has been highly ironic that during my psychiat uh, psych uh, psychiatric experiments I encounter the ingredients for psychosis in form of a psychic material by every turn. All of this can be found in a madhouse. It is a realm of unconscious images which puts the mentally ill into fatal confusion. On the other hand, those images represent a matrix of myth-building fantasies that has vanished from our rational world, even though this mystic fantasy is omnipresent. It is also feared and frowned upon. It appears to be a risky experiment and dubious adventure to confide to the uncertain path that leads to the depth of unconsciousness, a path of fallacy ambiguity and misunderstanding. If I recall Goethe's word, quote, presume yourself to open the gate which everyone prefers to walk by, unquote. Faust's second part is indeed more than a literary attempt. It is part of the Aurea Catena, which states an expedition to the other pole of our world. From the early beginnings of philosophic alchemy, it reaches over Gnosticism to Nietzsche's Zarathustra, most unpopular, ambiguous and dangerous. During times of working on fantasies, I needed grounding in this work world more than ever. This has been my family and my professional work. It has been of vital importance to lead a natural, rational life acting as counterweight to the foreign inner world. Family and work has always been the base to me, he says, to which I could always return. It made clear to me that I was a real existing and normal human being. The essence of the unconscious could sometimes drive me crazy. But my family, and knowing I have a doctor's degree, I have to help my patients, I have a wife, I have five children, and I live in Seestraße 228 in Küsnacht, Switzerland. Those have been the realities that required my attention. They proved to me day by day that I actually existed, instead of being a leaf tossed around by the wind of mine. Nietzsche has lost ground contact because he did not possess anything but the inner world of these thoughts, which indeed possessed him more than he possessed them. He was disrooted and was floating above the earth. Thus we have we, he was trapped in exaggeration and irreality. To me this irreality depicted the embodiment of horror because my objective has in fact been this world and this life. No matter how deep I dug, I always knew that all of this was related to my real life, which I wanted to fulfill in extent and meaning. My motto, motto has been always, hic hodos, hic salta. In this way, my family and work have always been key to a joyful reality, as well as a guarantee 
that I was normal and actually existed. <clears throat> I could slowly feel change coming up inside of me. In 1916, I felt the urge of creation. More or less, I was forced from the inside to formulate and express what also could have said Philomenon. Philomenon. Philemon. This is how Septem Sermones at Mortuos with its peculiar language was forged." Unquote. The central expression of his fantasies in the Red Book can be seen in the mandala as a monad which complies with the micro microscopic nature of soul. And Jung comments on this, quote, <clears throat> I do not remember how many mandalas I have painted back then. They were many. The same question came up to me over and over again while I was working on it. Where does this process that I find myself in is leading to? What is the goal? From my own experience I knew that I could not choose a goal by myself which would have appeared trustworthy to me. I had experienced that the idea of superordination of the ego must be dismissed in its entirety. This was exactly what made me fail. I wanted to continue the scientific processing of myth as I had begun in Wandlon und Symbole der Libido, maybe translated changes and symbols of libido. That was my goal. Far from it, I was forced to undergo the process of the unconscious myself. I had to let this flow get hold of me first, without knowing where it was going to take me. And only when I moved, and all the steps I took, had taken me back to the very point to the center. It became obvious. The mandala is the center. It is the expression of all paths. It is the path leading to the center, to the individuation. During the years of 1918 to approximately 1920, I was realized that the objective of psychic development is the self. There is no linear development, but rather a circumambulazione. A circumambulation of the self. An undirectional development can only be found in the early beginnings. Later, on every hint points, points toward the center. And this encounter gave me strength, and slowly my inner calmness was re-established. I knew that by creating the mandala as the expression of the self, I had reached my full potential. Maybe someone else knows better, but I do not. End of quote. In his comment to the exhibition of the Red Book, Guido Calva writes, quote, For Jung, what kept the human being together at heart could not be grasped by pure reason. In his eyes, there exists a psychic world where words have no access. Text cannot get to the bottom of the soul. This requires different means of creation. This is where the eminent versatility and complexity of the Jungian interest have their cause. The possibility of a different form of creation Jung has found in the symbol of mandalas, which actually has been the central aspect and expression of the Red Book. <clears throat> In the following, Walter Schwede said, we will take a closer look at this tremendous psychocosmogram. And in accordance with Giuseppe Tucci, they state the mysterious game of powers which act in the universe as well as in us. To the neophyte, it's about reintegration of the consciousness. consciousness. So to speak, it's an anticipation of modern death-step psychology practice. The mandala represents an archetype inherent to the human soul 
that repeatedly comes to light at the surface, under different skies, in different ages in similar dress, the human being strives to find its way back to the unity, which destroys or threatens or to destroy the overvaluation of one or another trait of personality. And in no way do I lack of knowledge about the ever new and expanding conquests of psychoanalysis, in particular those driven by Jung. Tucci points out that he is certain that Jung's method is meant to leave permanent imprints in the history of spirit, spirituality. And Jung comments on the meaning of the mandala himself in his book Psychology and Alchemy. In, quote, in 1938 I had the opportunity to talk about this mandala which a Lamaistic, a Rinpoche, called Lingdam Gomchen from the monastery Bhutya Pusti. He explained it to be a mikpa, a mental image, imago mentalis in Latin which can only be created by the imagination of an educated lama. No mandala, mandala is like the other, as they are individual different. Also mandalas that can be observed in temples or monasteries do not have any distinct meaning, as they are only external representations. And the true mandala always is the inner image which is slowly created through active imagination. This especially holds true of a disturbance of the spiritual equilibrium it's, is present or when a thought cannot be localized and thus has to be searched for since it is not part of the holy doctrine. The mandalas in their cultic use are of very great importance, as their center usually contains a figure of utmost religious value. Either Shiva itself, mostly in embracement with Shakti, or Buddha, or Amitabha, or Avalokiteshvara, or one of the great Mahayana teachers, or simply Doje, the symbol of all accumulated divine energy of creative and destructive nature. The text, the Golden Blossom, which stems from the Taoist syncreticism, reveals further specific alchemistic features of this center in the sense of lapis, quality as well as elixir vitae. Jung said, quote, recognizing this kind of high valuation is crucial. It coincides with the meaning of individual mandala symbols, which embrace the same qualities of, so to say, metaphysical future nature. Though so they mean it's not, if not mistaken, a psychic personality center which is not identical to the ego. I have observed these processes and structures for about 20 years on relatively large empirical material. In order to not prejudice my observance, observations, I have not written or spoken about it for 14 years." Unquote. This has been Jung's comment on the value of the mandalas. And nowadays, we know that a mandala symbol represents an autonomous psychic reality which is characterized by an ever-repeating and overall identical phenomenology it seems to be some sort of a core atom about the inner structure and final meaning of which we do not know anything. We can also see it as a real effective mirror, a mirror image of consciousness attitude, which can neither name a goal nor a motivation and thus project its activity only onto a virtual center of the mandala due to this sacrifice. <clears throat> the dearness that is needed for such purpose lies within the situation of the individual, 
that knows no other alternatives. On the contrary, there is reasoning that contradicts mere psychological reflection. On the one hand, there is the autonomous nature of the symbol, which reveals itself in dreams and visions of sporadic, overwhelming, overwhelming spontaneity. On the other hand, there is the autonomous nature of the unconscious in general, which is not only just the original from the psychic matter, but also the state that we pass through during childhood as well return to every night. There is no evidence for claiming the pure reactive reflexive nature of psyche. At best, this is a biological working hypothesis with limited validity. Raised to a level of genuine truth, it is nothing but a materialistic myth, because it disregards the simply present creative ability of the soul. In contrast, of which all cause appear as sheer events. <clears throat> In conclusion, I would like to illustrate an individual mandala using the example of a dream, Baltashwari says, a dream series of an 86-year-old woman. She claimed to not have been able to ever recall any of her dreams during the, her whole life. Neither has she suffered from severe disease in her, in her life. Now she finally turned terminally ill. She became a nursing case, which induced, just as described by Kübler-Oss, protest, aggression, but also fear, fear in the first phase of her dying process. During those times of extreme hardship, five dreams appeared to her in short intervals. First. In her first dream, she found herself sitting in a large airplane heading westbound across the island of Lanzarote. It's in the an island, islands in the Atlantic Ocean, an island of black volcanic stone. A voice told her that she would die if she landed here. Second, the second dream led her towards the south, to Italy to Franz von Assisi. She was hungry and the saint gave her bread to ally her hunger. The dreamer has been reformed. In the third dream she headed no towards north to Karelia. She was at the polar sea, lonely and suffering from the cold. Fourthly, she dreamed of being inside a Japanese imperial house where she met the Empress Michiko. And finally, in her fifth dream, she was at Lake Constance, Germany. She could see a snow-white ship anchored in the harbor. A large staircase holding a red carpet led all the way from the ship down to where she was standing. And at the top of the staircase, the captain, in his white uniform, was standing. He was expecting her holding a large bouquet of red and white roses, welcoming her on her journey to the other shore. Ladies and gentlemen, in alchemy, red and white symbolizes, symbolize the colors of marriage, respectively also the colors of death marriage. The mystic rose also stands for rebirth of the spirit after death in the here and now. The rose represents in the Occident what the lotus stands for in the East. Rose and lotus are symbols of the self in accordance with Jung, also called the spiritual center of a human being or its true nature. Whoever finds it is redeemed. 
Furthermore, the four geographic directions occurring in her dreams also embody the four basic functions of humans. Perception, feeling, thinking and intuition. In the Tibetan mandala, those four directions correspond to the four fundamental colors, which are psychic qualities or basic functions. The Tibetan word mandala means protecting circle, in which four gates lead to the center and thus enable redemption and freedom. And from a psychological perspective, the mandala also has a purpose to avoid a dissociation of the personality in the post-mortem state. Goal of this journey Inside the bardo is the mandala's core, the white light, or the self. After her very last dream, all fear, all tension, all resistance against her fate has faded away. Inner peace had radiated her from her eyes, and some days later she fell asleep calmly. Jung explained that his visionary experiences noted in the Red Book have been the foundation of his whole life work. And during his entire lifetime, he dealt with processing what came to the surface from the unconsciousness and flooded him like a mysterious stream. That should be enough said about the historical meaning of this book in this lecture. Now Walter Schwerie comes to the speechlessness of Carl Gustav Jung. He is starting with a poem from a German um, writer, author, Christian Morgenstern, and said, let me start with this poem. It's a free translation just now. Those who traveled toward the truth travel alone. Nobody can be companion to the other. For a while we walk together. They, we're singing, singing in a core. Until at last we see everyone lost himself, each other. After completing the book Changes and Symbols of Libido in 1911, Carl Gustav Jung was unable to read any scientific book for three years. He felt as if he was incapable of participating in the global intellect. <clears throat> Could not have talked about what bothered him. The material that arose from Jung's conscious, unconscious left him speechless, so to say. He, that's what he wrote in his memoirs. The impact that the numinous had on him was so dramatically that he neglected his ac academic career in order to completely focus on the unconscious. Quote, The result of my decision and my engagement with things that neither I nor others could understand was great loneliness. I had to realize pretty soon, I, had, I carried around thoughts in my head that I could not talk about with anyone. They would have only been misunderstood." Unquote. So it became Jung's first task to communicate a new manière de voir, translated a new perspective, to those who were close to him. He knew that if he would not do so, he would be condemned to complete loneliness. <clears throat> Retrospectively, Jung admitted that he had never completely succeeded to overcome this loneliness. Quote, <clears throat> as a child, I felt lonely and I still to do today. This is because I know many things 
and point them out that others apparently do not know anything about. Most likely, they also do not even want to know anything about them. If a human being knows more than another, he or she will become lonely. Nevertheless, loneliness is not necessarily the counterpart of community, as no one appreciates community more than the lonely one. Community can only flourish where the individual keeps its very own manners and does not identify with everyone else." Unquote. <clears throat> what were those things that one cannot communicate and thought that others may assume to be unlikely? What has Jung remained silent about? It must have been an experience, a vision that eludes from abstract concepts. It can be found in the realm of fascinosum and tremendum what Rudolf Otto calls the holy. These experiences have been a triggering event for Jung to start a lifelong experiment of giving validity to this concept. Eventually, this has led him to the individuation process. This process should not be seen as a final achievement in life. It rather embodies a specific preparation for an experience that the Western human being must perform. And without this preparation process, it could neither be integrated nor sustained. This is about an individual that has suffered the complete abolishment of his ego in the absolute conflict, <coughs> as displayed by Christ versus Saturn. Jung alluded to the unity of the Holy Spirit as the pneumatic state that is achieved by the Creator after the phase of incarnation. This state represents the re-establishment of the original unity of the unconscious on the level of consciousness. As Christ said, you are gods. It is the upcoming evolution from a Christian aeon of the Son to the aeon of the Holy Spirit. Giacchino da Fiori calls this the Evangelium Eternum. Such a vision grants the divine grace as a form of consolamentum, so that the individual does not drown in hopelessness during times of darkness. And from a historical perspective, we are in one of those phases of darkness right now. Jung realized this by seeing the Adventus Diaboli, the arrival of Christ's opponent, which he nevertheless does not label as a devaluation of the Christian symbol. More so, it can be seen as its completion. This is the requirement of a mysterious change on both sides. Jung claimed it to be his task to look into the future and talk about the upcoming matters. Quote, but I have to be really careful not to destroy the existing. Nobody is foolish enough to destroy the foundation of the house when he wants to build a new floor. When I come to the conclusion that Christ is no complete symbol of the Self, I do not accomplish the fulfillment of it by discarding the symbol. I have to retain it and add darkness to this lumen, delumine, light, in order to create this symbol as a total counterpart of God. I come closer to the end of it, I come closer to the end of the Christian aeon, and I have to tie in with the expectations of Giacchino da Fiori, as well with Christ's prophecy about the arrival of the Paraclete. And at the same time, this archetype drama is exquisitely 
psychological and historical. We live in times of global separation, unfortunately, and devaluation of Christ. But the anticipation of a far future is no loophole from the current situation. It is merely consolamentum for those that despair of the gruesome possibilities of our age. Jung state that the great challenge of present times is dealing with the shadow. Whereas the future will be about the unity of the Holy Spirit, just as the act of salvation, which God spread among mankind using Christ as an example, the matter of this salvation act, which contains the divine secret, can be discovered everywhere. According to the alchemists, it can be even found in the most filthy pile of dirt. The opus is hence no longer a ritual officium, but an individual opus which can be identified by the philosopher through the Donum Spiritus Sancti, the divine, divine art. This cheap matter, which can be found everywhere, is the energy that fascinated Freud in the form of sexuality and Reich, the author Reich, as organ energy. And in modern times, this energy can be seen as a trigger for youth revolts, starting from the hippies over the students' riots to the 1968 movement all the way to Russia's pussy riot and the youth revolution in the Middle East. This matter is also represented by the penetrating libido, the essence of which Jung identified as pure energy and experienced as Kundalini in the Middle East. This matter is the kinetic energy of Whitsuntide, which Kurt Koch also labeled as the Holy Spirit. Already the alchemists have stressed that experiencing this, the effect of this energy is a completely individual event. Quote, those who operate through the spirit of someone else and for monetary reason will obtain results that are far from reality and vice versa. The one who works as a laboratory assistant for someone else will never be granted permission to the mystery of the Queen." Unquote. From my psychological perspective, this means that the dependence coming with the master-student relation must not lead to change. To a change. Lastly, the adept faces this matter of our spirit alone until he realizes that he is not different from it. In accordance with the dogmatic requirements of Christianity, God is complete in any of the three persons. Thus, he also is complete in every part of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> also in the manner of the alchemists. Jung says that in this way every human being can experience the complete God as well as filatio, the divine childhood. Thus the complexio oppositorum of the divine image penetrates the individual not as a unit but as a conflict in which the dark side of the image represents the fact that God is only light. Jung then literally says, quote, it is the process which takes place in our age that is not recognized by the corresponding teachers of mankind, even though it would be their task to do so. Everyone is convinced that we are in a place of dramatic change. But we are misunderstood by thinking that this process was induced by fission and fusion of atoms or space, or space rockets. As usual, one ignores that what takes place inside the human soul at the, time, at the same time." Unquote. According to Jung, the advancement of the myth should be continued where the Holy Spirit laid itself upon the Apostles and turned from, in, from them 
turned them into God's Son. But not only the apostles, but also those who received Philatia, the divine childhood. Consequently, they realized that they were not only earthborn animalia, but rooted, rooted in God himself by being born for the second time. Jung expressed these insights over 25 years ago. It has been indications and hints to an experience for which he has not seen to the necessary predisposition in the Western society yet. <clears throat> society needed to return to the creative fantasies that have been pushed aside by church and science, unfortunately. So to say, experiencing and integrating the cove of fantasy in a night cruise across the ocean. Only when the Western individual has mastered this path, it will be ready for the room of power or the kingdom of the Holy Spirit, the spirit that eventually heals. Jung claimed that if the creative fantasy is granted every dimension of freedom, the individual is inherently led to discovering a spark of divinity inside itself. However, Church fears the individual creation of symbols and had prevented this by any means to the present day. The global apocalyptic situation seems to have geared up more and more people to receive the consolamentum of the Holy Spirit. As generally known, the Holy Spirit waves wherever it wishes. For some it comes as a spark from the East, in the West, paths for experience appear to have opened due to the charismatic movement within the Catholic Church and the Whitsuntide movement, the Protestantism. The experiences within those movements are described as new feelings of happiness and freedom that can also be noticed by the senses. As in Zida Yoga, the body is also included by clapping hands, rising of the arms, shouting and yelling, strong rhythm, rhythmic songs, dancing and laying on hands. Yves Congar contributed to the Second Vatican Council and its consequences with a theological work. He stated that the Christian Reformation movement could induce a new Christian practice. Nevertheless, he doubted that this movement, as it occurs, would affect the Church as a whole. This path will remain hidden to the majority. For those there will be another path, which should, a, which should a develop an analog to yoga, a path of psychological experience. It may appear, appear poor compared to the Indian and Eastern Asian systems, and to the traditions of Christianity. But we find ourselves only at the very beginning. As the author Heyer said, it was Carl Gustav Jung who took the crucial steps on this path. For Freud, the unconscious has only been a sphere of repressed. Jung, on the other hand, showed the Western world how the unconscious is an autonomous world. He considered the mandala from the Red Book to be an expression of this energy, which is called the urge of, for individuation. It is an energy that leads to wholeness of the human being, as well as to a spirit that creates wholeness. Theologically, this is the Holy Spirit. In the preface of his book Aeon, he stressed that it is not his intention to make a statement of confession or propagandistic nature. In fact, he thought about how it could be possible to grasp certain matters from the perspective of modern consciousness. Matters that would lessen our global disorientation through enlightening the psychic backgrounds and undergrounds. Those are the thoughts and experiences that led to the Red Book. But it was also thought that Jung could 
to communicate to anyone back then. Thus he tried to mediate a new manière de voir to his loved ones, as, as yeah, I see, Mr. Schwery said. Otherwise Jung would have been condemned to absolute loneliness. <coughs> Nevertheless, he admitted to never have fully overcome, as it was said already, this loneliness and speechlessness. And in his poem, Selige Sehnsucht, translated Blissful Yearning, Johann Wolfgang Goethe pretty well displayed the reason for Jung's silence and loneliness. Tell this to no one but the wise, for the masses will just ridicule it. I would praise the living thing that yearns for death in the flames. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. I thank my friend Walza for this great lecture, and it was a pleasure and honor for me to present it to you in English. Thanks to everybody who was involved. Namaste. Dear friend, it was beautiful how you present my contribution of this team. Thank you very much, Eric. I tried my best. <laughs>